Welcome back to BEFM Drama. I'm your host, Ryan Estrada, and I'm sure you're sick of hearing about it by now, but for those that are just joining us, this season we're digging up Charles Dickens' long-forgotten, wildly inconsistent, ill-justified 22-book series of sequels to A Christmas Carol, and remixing them into brand new, modern-day radio plays. This is part four of our adaptation of the 1861 edition, Tom Tiddler's Ground. In this final episode of The Hermit Saga, we're adapting the chapters Picking Up Miss Kameens and Picking Up the Tinker, both by Charles Dickens himself. Goblin has been sharing stories of the outside world to try and convince a hermit to leave his apartment to get the medical assistance he needs. In our last episode, he finally got the man into the ambulance, and his stories made the hermit realize what a big mistake he'd made, hiding himself away from the world for so long. He had turned his back on his family and the rest of the planet without even remembering why. The confusion started making him feel bad all over again. But Goblin could empathize with that feeling, and he had one more story that he thought might make the Hermit feel less alone. Maybe the Hermit will get something out of it, and maybe Goblin's new partner, who's sitting in the front seat, might get something out of it all as well. Please enjoy BFM Drama's production of The Hermit's Heartbreak. I'll tell you one more story. Oh, good. Good, an ambulance story? No. I'll tell you a story about my own life. Oh, do tell. I was just a kid. My parents were at a wedding, and their neighbor was keeping an eye on me. I was thrilled. I loved when Miss Bella babysat me. She always gave me my popsicles and let me watch TV as much as I liked. I was having a blast. But then, Miss Bella got a phone call, and she started crying. I asked her what was wrong. She told me nothing. She called my parents and told them to come home at once. I thought I'd done something wrong, but I was in trouble. So I started crying. She told me that her mother was very sick, and she needed to be with her. And then she cried some more. I liked Miss Bella, so I cried even more. I told her to go see her mom, but she said she couldn't because she had to watch me. I told her my parents could watch me. She said they were far away. It would take a long time for them to get home. I told her I could go with her, but her mom was in another state. I told her I was a big boy and I could stay home all by myself. She said she couldn't leave me all alone. I said that she could. I was old enough to take care of myself. I told her, Miss Bella, you are so nice and so kind, and you do so many good things for me, like give me popsicles. I care about you, and I don't want you to cry. Don't let me keep you. Call my parents. Ask them if it's okay to leave me here until they get back. They'll understand. You had so much understanding and empathy as a child. Well, honestly, in the back of my mind, I was just counting the seconds until she left, and I could eat the rest of the box of popsicles. What did your parents say? They said if it was okay with me, it was okay with them. Miss Bella was still crying. She said she didn't want to leave me alone. She didn't want me to think she was unkind. It was her job to care for me. I told her that I cared for her too, and if she truly cared about me, she would go do me the honor of letting me help her in her time of need. And then you were all alone! The heavy house door closed with a bang and a shake, and shut me up in a wilderness of a house. But I was self-reliant and methodical, so I began to parcel out the long summer day before me. I was making big plans. For the next six hours, popsicles, jumping on the bed, R-rated movies, but first, I decided to go all over the house to make sure that nobody with a trench coat and a carving knife had gotten under one of the beds or into one of the cupboards. Was that a... was that a concern? Not that I had ever been troubled by the image of anybody armed with a trench coat and a carving knife before. 
but the mental image seemed to have been shaken into existence by the shake and bang of the door and reverberated through the solitary house. So I looked at my parents' beds, then under my own bed. Then I was making the tour of the cupboards, and suddenly the disagreeable thought came into my head. What was it? What a very alarming thing it would be to find somebody with a Dracula mask on, hiding upright in a corner and pretending not to be alive. I then went to the freezer and pulled out the popsicles, but I heard a really scary noise coming from the fridge. I'd never been in an empty house before, so I'd never heard the motor running. I dropped the popsicles and ran out of the kitchen, scared. Well, what did you do then? I tried to watch a movie. I came to the sad realization that I did not know how to work the VCR. So I sat, alone on my dad's chair. The silence all around me soon grew very oppressive and the more so because of the odd inconsistency that the more silent it was, the more noises there were. The clock conducted itself in a way in which it had never conducted itself before. Time seemed not to move at all, and yet the clock persisted in running on as hard and as loud as it could. The tick, tick, ticking pounded in my head. That sounds like Every day of my life. I decided to go take a nap, but I felt weird going into my own bedroom. There was a stealthy air about the innocent white curtains, and there were even dark hints of a dead girl lying under the sheets. My great want of human company started to express itself in the furniture suddenly gaining strange exaggerated resemblances to human looks. A chair with a menacing frown was horribly out of temper in a corner. A most vicious chest of drawers snarled from between the windows. It was no relief to escape from those monsters to the mirror, for the reflection said, What? Is that you all alone there? How you stare? The day dragged on, dragging me with it very slowly by the hair of my head, until it was time to eat. I picked up the popsicles from the floor, but the whole box had melted into a pile of goop. I looked around the rest of the kitchen. I didn't know how to make any food. I was hungry, scared, and grumpy. I'm always grumpy. But this was by no means the worst of the change in my cheery little disposition as the solitary day wore on. I began to brood and be suspicious. I discovered that I was full of wrongs and injuries. All the people I knew got tainted by my lonely thoughts and turned bad. What were my parents doing at some dumb wedding without me anyway? Why wasn't I invited? Was there even really a wedding at all? Or did they just want some excuse to get away from me? Why would anyone go to a wedding? Love wasn't real. People would just tell you they loved you and then abandon you in an empty house full of melted popsicles and Dracula mask killers. That's how I feel all the time. And Miss Bella, how dare she leave? She probably never wanted to be there to begin with. She probably only let me watch so much TV so she could keep me busy and out of her hair. I decided that if I had no one who loved me, I was going to run away far from home. Where did you go? To the end of my driveway. Then my parents got home. It had only been 45 minutes. They made me macaroni and cheese, and everything was fine. Oh. The point is, when we're all alone like that, it can twist our thoughts. It can put hate in our hearts. Make us feel like we'll be alone forever. I felt it, after 45 minutes. You've been alone for 40 years. You're right. And when I get better, I, I'm not going back to that house. I'm gonna go back to my hometown to see my family. I'm gonna make it all up with them and I'm gonna make things right. And I'm gonna learn to love again. I'm glad to hear that. And you know what? I finally remembered what happened to me all those years ago. I finally remembered the origin of my life as a hermit. I've never told anyone before. 
but I'm learning to trust people and let them in. Can I tell you my story? Hmm. No. It was my first day on the job. I was in the front of the ambulance, while my new partner, Goblin, stayed in the back, tending to our patient. The smell was overpowering. I mostly drove with my head out the window. I couldn't imagine how Goblin was handling it, trapped in the back. The hermit's landlord sat in front with me. He had wanted to come with us to make sure his tenant was okay, even though they'd not spoken for 40 years. He still seemed to care for the man. He also seemed to be unfazed by the smell. I guess living in the same building, he had gradually gotten used to it over the decades. The only thing I could do to take my mind off the odor was to listen intently to the stories that Goblin and the Hermit were sharing in the back. After they finished, the landlord turned and tried to make awkward conversation with me to break the silence. So, uh... How about that weather tonight, huh? Uh, I'm not particular about it. Looks like you got a tear in your eye. Is that from the stories or the smell? I don't know. Maybe a little of both. Well, if you learned something, maybe it's a good first day on the job after all. I'm glad to see you employed. I'm glad to be employed. But why are you so glad? I thought you were a lazy fellow when I saw you this morning. I was only disgusted. You mean with the weather? <laughs> with the weather? You told me you were not particular as to weather, so I thought, Oh no, no, the weather's fine. How should any of us get on if we were particular as to the weather? We must take it as it comes and make the best of it. There's something good in all weathers. If it don't happen to be good for my work today, it's good for some other man's work today and will come around to me tomorrow. We must all live. We must all live indeed. So, uh, you were disgusted with the smell then? At first. But now I'm disgusted with myself. Why's that? I didn't want to take this job. You know, I was expecting to get a cushy job at my dad's company right out of college. The kind where Nobody quite knows what you do, and if you're honest, you don't either. But you sure do get paid a lot to do it. But my dad said I needed to learn the value of hard work. He started from nothing. Had a little repair shop, fixing up tea kettles and pots and pans. Kept building up and up until he had a corporation worth hundreds of millions. He said he would give me a comfortable life, but I needed to experience the kind of work it took to build it first. He told me to spend one year in the hardest job I possibly could. The harder the work, the cushier the job I could get at the end. I figured, you know, working here as a paramedic was as intense a job as I could get. All the training, all the late nights, emergencies, the smells. It didn't seem like you were ready for all that work. I thought I could coast through it. I'd let my partner do all the work and regale my dad with all the stories. Heck, maybe he'd be so impressed he'd let me quit early. I thought it'd be some cushy and soft job to sleep through, and then I saw all this desolation and ruination. I felt so ashamed and disgusted that I had to help care for this man, that so many are forced to live in such desolation by poverty and illness. And this guy was living that by his own choice, choosing to go ragged and grimy masquerading in what is the real heart lot of thousands and thousands of people. But then I realized I was doing the same thing. Masquerading as a hard-working man while offering nothing to the world. It's an unbearable and nonsensical piece of inconsistency and I'm disgusted. I'm ashamed and disgusted. So are you going to take this job more seriously until your one year's penance is up? You know... I don't even think I'm qualified to be here. I think I'm doing more harm than good just playing the part. I don't want to just fake it till I can live on my father's dime. I want to go out, learn more, and build something of my own. If 
find out what I am good at and what does good in the world and work hard at doing it. I want to make something of my own. You got all that from the rantings of a whiny, smelly old hermit and an angry, sleep-deprived paramedic? Well, they're not professed philosophers, but I suspect there's some hint of philosophy in their words. Maybe. Maybe. Thank you for listening to BEFM Drama. This concludes our four-part hermit saga. Goblin got exactly what he thought he wanted, a partner that would be quiet and leave him alone. But he realized when he got it, that wasn't what he wanted at all. And their adventure together made him realize that he did need to keep the people who were important to him close. And not let petty fights rip them apart. In our next episode, we'll check back in with Fern to see how he's getting along with his new partner. I wonder if he'll have better luck. You know, he was wishing for a partner who loved talking, who shared his passions, and who included him in their decision making. I'm sure his new partner will be just like that, and it won't backfire at all and teach him a valuable but painful message like a wish made from a monkey's paw. Nope, nothing like that at all. Um, I guess we'll just have to wait and see. This was The Hermit's Heartbreak, based on Picking Up Miss Kameens and Picking Up the Tinker, both by Charles Dickens from the book Tom Tiddler's Ground. This radio play was written by me, Ryan Estrada. It starred Sam Hazelton as Goblin, Kelly Brassbridge as Mr. Mope, and me as New Kid and Landlord. Hidden Agenda is by Kevin McLeod of Incompetech and released under Creative Commons Attribution License. Goblin's theme, Dismal, Endless March of Sadness, and Played by Ear are by Unheard Music Concepts. Thank you for listening. See you next time.